Okay, great. Thanks so much. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. So let me share my screen. Okay, uh, are you able to see the screen or? Yes, we're seeing. We are. We Wonderful, are. great. Great, well, uh, thanks very much. Um, so this is, um, uh, I'll be, in this talk, I'll be focusing uh, primarily on the issue of vaccines, which is obviously only a subset of the broader issue of, uh, of, uh, of COVID-19 and planning for pandemic preparedness. I know that Eric has talked about some other things, uh, so I'll, I'll pick up on the vaccine issue. Let me also note that uh, this is um, what I'll be talking about today. Most of it is from joint work with other people. Um, um, and I'll, I'll try and cite some of those people throughout, but uh, there's a group of researchers who've been working on these issues called the Accelerating Health Technologies Group. And a couple of articles are listed here that we've published, but there's also uh, some articles that subsets of us have done and things that were done earlier. This will this will be a uh, this talk is adapted from talks for policymakers, uh, which means that there won't be Greek letters. There'll be examples and so on, but you can you can fill in the Greek letters. Um, the but would also be very happy to discuss them with people. Um, uh, bring um, and. Um, but I think it also illustrates that very basic concepts from economics, really things that are taught in principles of economics classes, uh, can have can be important for uh, lots of practical problems that uh, the society faces. Okay. Let me give you a bit of a outline of what I'd like to uh, what I'd like to discuss. Um, let me start off with some sort of general principles. Uh, regarding um, regarding uh, incentivizing innovation, but then talk about why the case of vaccine, in case of vaccines at least, and perhaps more broadly, there may be possibilities to escape some of the um, tensions or dilemmas that affect a lot, that often affect uh, incentivizing R and D uh, through advanced contracting. So I'll talk about one example where that was done. Uh, about 10 years ago, and then move on to the case of COVID-19. Within, um, I'll then talk about most, the first couple of sections will present the problem as if there's a single policymaker, but in fact, there's, uh, in the case of COVID-19, there are multiple national policymakers and thinking about incentives for those policymakers is, uh, is an important part of the problem. Then. Uh, in the fourth section, I'll talk about preparing for the next pandemic. And then finally, I'll conclude with something that I think is both relevant for COVID-19, but also in preparing for future pandemics. A particular example where I think the gap between private R&D incentives and social incentives is huge and where we may be missing an opportunity to dramatically accelerate uh, the, the pace of vaccination globally. So starting off most generally, you know, patents um, are a very common tool for incentivizing innovation and patent system or intellectual property rights more generally incentivize innovation for, by rewarding inventors with temporary monopolies. So there's an obvious advantage of that, which I think is, is not, to be, uh, you know, not to be minimized, which is this at least roughly ties the reward to the value of innovation. And there are many innovations that you can think of where it would be very difficult to decide what the appropriate reward would be if we, um, if we, if we or to have some bureaucratic system do that. You know, the post-it note is an example. You know, we, nobody really knew we needed post-it notes until we got them. Even now that we have them, what's the consumer surplus associated with post-it notes? 
I, I imagine that uh, somebody could estimate that, but uh, I'm sh it wouldn't be easy. Okay, so there's, that's an advantage of, of the patent system as a form of rewarding innovation. There's obviously a huge disadvantage as well. There are many disadvantages, but one disadvantage is that monopolies typically restrict access. There, there are many, there are other dynamic distortions associated with, uh, with monopolies as well. So this is uh, restricting access sounds like a very bloodless, uh, a bloodless thing, but in a time of COVID, we recognize, uh, or when we're thinking about health uh, uh, in general, this, this is a matter of life and death. If people can't get access, then, uh, then they may die. And, that, and particularly in the middle of a pandemic, governments have very strong incentives to restrict intellectual property rights. You know, the, the, if you think about this as a trade-off between the, the dynamic benefit of incentives and the static losses from, uh, from, from restricting access, well, in a pandemic, there might be very, there, the static losses are gonna loom very large. And we've seen moves to waive patent rights during, uh, during, uh, during COVID-19, for example. Um, the, um, so I think this raises the question of whether we can find other ways to reward innovation, at least in some sectors, that don't carry this inherent trade-off where we're sacrificing static efficiency, again, something very important in a pandemic, uh, for the sake of research incentives. So one approach, um, you know, I, I've written you know, about this and I originally wrote about uh, buying out patents, but then when I started to focus on vaccines and this was uh, you know, bef before COVID, there are some properties of vaccines that I think make it more plausible than in most cases to try to create systems that incentive, both incentivize innovation and avoid distorting access. Why is that? Well, first, vaccines are highly regulated. They're typically purchased by governments anyway. Um, so some of the in questions that would come up in valuing many innovations are, um, are partially addressed through the regulatory system. We, we have information on the safety of vaccines, on their efficacy. Um, there's... Um, we also have information on the burden of disease in many cases. There, we have some sense of the death toll from COVID. Um, so it's fairly clear that the, um, and, th and that's true for, for many other diseases, obviously. So in many cases, since vaccines are only approved by the regulators if they're very safe, it's basically optimal to give them to everybody if it's a childhood vaccine in a birth cohort, if it's a, in the case of COVID, basically anybody who's willing to take them among right now among adults but it'll it'll, the, um, it'll be approved for you know, the the process of expanding this to children is is ongoing we also have some sense of the marginal cost um, constructing the factories is pretty is does involve some costs but um, these costs are very low but the actual production marginal cost is pretty limited, certainly any very, very limited relative to the social value of the vaccines uh, of what would be approved. So Rachel Glenister and I uh, wrote a book um, in 2004 and some, you know, there's some papers earlier than that, um, suggesting something called advanced market commitments. And the idea of advanced market commitments was that governments or donors would legally commit that if a vaccine is developed that meets certain technical specifications, that they would co-finance the initial purchases. And then to try to get the optimal production and solve the static distortion, uh, there are a couple of ways that could be done or, a couple, or several steps that might be useful. First, specifying the price for the initial doses, that's to, to basically get the two-part tariff to get the reward to produce but also specifying a tail price, a maximum price that can be charged um, uh, in an ongoing way. And because of the particular production characteristics of vaccines, which I'll talk about later, you know, there's, um, 
patents are important for vaccines, but not, but there's a lot of other protection for the first mover. The patents aren't that important uh, relative to uh, therapeutics where they're, they're really critically important. So um, the, it may be necessary, or I think it is necessary to actually incentivize the producers to build out sufficient capacity to get to the efficient level of production. Um, the, um, so you know, in, in our book, we argued that it was worth doing this for uh, malaria vaccines. We focused on technologically uh, distant targets. Um, then was involved in a commission at the Center for Global Development that, um, um, that recommended both doing this for distant target. We tried to move from a, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a book to something that was much more of a concrete policy proposal. And you know, we, we recommended not only doing it for a distant target, but also doing a pilot with a, a, a target that was technologically closer. Um, so the, this, a number of governments and donors uh, pledged 1.5 billion for an advanced market for vaccines against the strains of pneumococcus that are common in low income countries and lower middle income countries. Um, and they pledged $1.5 billion. Three vaccines were then produced. It's estimated those, those have now reached hundreds of millions of people. Um, and it's estimated that 700,000 lives have been saved. Why was this an easier technological challenge? There were already vaccines against the strains common in high income countries, but not against the strains common in, in lower income and middle income countries. Um, the vaccine, there's, it looks like you can, it's very hard to know the counterfactual of whether uh, the vaccines would have been produced anyway, but it does look like on the access side, this helped. So vaccine coverage in Gavi eligible countries, the, the poorest countries in the world, caught up to rich country rates much faster than for other vaccines where there weren't advanced market commitments. And that um, um, John Levin and Chris Snyder were very involved in in the technical design of this. And um, we and we just wrote, just prior to this pandemic, uh, we wrote a, a 10 year retrospective on the on the advanced market commitment for pneumococcus. Um, so I, I've put here a lot of things that went well. I, I do think that probably the, you know, the design could have been improved and we can learn. You know, if we, I think if we think about institutions for innovation, you know, we're constantly refining the patent system. We should think about trying these out, getting experience, uh, collecting data and refining them. So, and so let me turn to um, the case of COVID-19. So in part because of this experience, when the, um, when COVID, uh, when the COVID pandemic uh, started, was contacted by policymakers interested in the question of whether an advanced market commitment would be appropriate for COVID-19. So contacted Chris and John and other economists uh, who'd been in involved in the, uh, in the advanced market commitment for pneumococcus, as well as uh, 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 other uh, experts in industrial, primarily an in industrial organization um, who, who had like Susan Athey, um, who had um, to try and think about this case. And, we wound up recommending something that was similar in some ways, but also but different in others. So let me tell you a little bit more. But um, you know, be, let me go into some background on vaccine development and production. Um, so historically, most vaccine candidates fail. There's historical data. Vaccines are tested in, in various stages, stage one, stage, phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, most candidates that enter the process drop out. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a funnel that uh, eliminates most vaccines. Um, the, um, and then even after the, even if the vaccine's found to be found to be effective and safe, installing the vaccine production capacity is very tricky. It's very different than, uh, than the small molecules that are used for therapeutics, which generic companies can, can if, can now reproduce fairly easily. Um, it's quite difficult to set up the factories um, and it's quite time consuming. Even if you're just repurposing a factory from 
producing one vaccine to another. It's also, it's expensive relative to producing uh, therapeutics. It's expensive relative to, uh, to you know, the, uh, the, the you know, normal sums of money that we talk about in everyday life. It's extremely inexpensive relative to the cost of something like COVID-19, but it's expensive relative to what industry is normally used to. I guess that's the, that's a key point. Why is this? Um, partly because the, the process, there's a saying in the industry, the process is the product. This is not, um, each step has to be individually tested, um, each step in the, in the factory. Um, and it's not the, for biologicals, for vaccines, it's typically not the uh, product that's, that's licensed, it's the factor. Um, so it takes years to construct new vaccine capacity. It takes more than six months to repurpose the existing capacity. And we spoke to um, you know, we spoke to a number of vaccine experts uh, early on who seem to have very much of the ONTF model. There's you know can we if we put more money at this? Can we speed it up? No, it's like having a baby. It takes nine months. Can't do anything about it. So. You know, that's, uh, those are anecdotes that we have from talking to a few experts, but the Center for Global Development did a survey in October 2020, so quite late. Um, at that point, they, experts predicted only a 2% chance of a vaccine being approved by the end of 2020, and that only 115 million doses would be ready by the end of 2021. Um, they, you know, I think this is a in some ways, a typical engineer economist uh, um, difference in views. The engineers think, what can we do? Um, uh, the economists say, well, if you throw more money at it, can, you, know, you must be able to do more. Um, but so let me give you the uh, why, why as economists, we thought it's worth throwing more money at this. So I think this is something that's true during pandemics in general. Um, but was certainly true during the COVID-19 pandemic. The social value of manufacturing capacity is much, much greater than the private value. One way of getting at this is to just look at the IMF or World Bank or OECD estimates of GDP losses. So they would estimate you know, uh, $12 billion in losses, or sorry, $12 trillion in losses over a two year period. Um, that's um, 500 billion uh, per month. So anything that you can do to speed access is the, the value of that dwarfs uh, the, what's normally considered high costs in the pharmaceutical industry. The time, you know, uh, time till vaccination is going to be roughly the time to build the capacity or repurpose it, plus the number of people to vaccinate divided by the capacity. So the social value of putting in additional capacity is, is huge. Um, the, um, and the social value of getting that capacity in early is huge. The, um, by the way, I, I should say this 500 billion in short run GDP costs, you know, that's 12 trillion for the world. Cutler and Summers have a paper where they try to estimate the full costs, the health costs, you know, other costs. They estimate, I believe, 18 trillion for the US alone. I should check my numbers on that. But the comprehensive costs are much larger. So, you know, we didn't go anywhere out near Cutler and Summers, but we just, uh, you know, adding a little bit in, we estimate the social value of a marginal course, the ability to produce one more course of vaccine, two doses per year in early 2021, even taking into account that, that there are roughly 3 billion uh, doses of capacity already in place. We estimate the marginal value about $1,400. Let me note that you know, this is underestimating things for two reasons. Uh, first, there are equity benefits of greater capacity in addition to these efficiency um, uh, uh, gains. Um, because the, if you think about, the, think about a queue, if the queue is two years long for everybody in the world to get vaccines and you double vaccine capacity, you know, for the for somebody who's two weeks into that queue, you know, you're moving things from two weeks to one week until they get the, the vaccine. If you're a year into the queue, you're moving things from two years to one year. So greater capacity 
inherently contributes to, to greater equity. There's also benefits because the faster people are vaccinated, the less chance that the, the less number of new strains that appear um, and that, that put us, uh, even the already vaccinated people at, at risk, potentially. Um, so the, the social value is enormous. This $1,400 is, is almost certainly a, an underestimate. But in the middle of an epidemic, uh, and certainly a pandemic, there are ethical, there are social, there are political limits on prices. It's just impossible to charge. If a firm said, well, we're not selling to governments, we're going to auction off the vaccine. Or even if we said, well, we're going to auction it off to the countries that pay the most, uh, there would have been, a, a, I think, they, they themselves might not have considered it ethical, but it's also, I think there would have been a political, a very strong political backlash against that. So the prices that we're seeing range from $6 for Oxford vaccine, which is explicitly saying they want to do this on a not-for-profit basis, up to $40 for Pfizer, um, which you know, was very careful to say we're not taking government money, et cetera. But even they are not pricing above $40. They have they do have commercial reason, they'll get commercial benefits from this. Uh, so, I do, But still, the gap between the prices and the social value is immense. And I'm not arguing that, the, that it's wrong to limit prices, but, if we, but I do think it's, if, in some ways that's besides the point, whether it's right or wrong, it's inevitable. And if there's gonna be such a big gap between the commercial incentives and the social value, then there's a case for government support for installing and repurposing capacity early and at large scale. What do I mean by early? Well, typically in firms, in vaccines, firms don't build the vex, don't build out very large scale capacity until they know the vaccine's working, until the tests are done. The tests take many months. Building the capacity or repurposing it takes many months. If you look at that 500 billion monthly loss, from a social point of view, it's worth putting in the capacity in parallel with testing, even though, you know, certainly our, when we estimated things and um, uh, we estimated a, you know, a substantial, we estimated that most vaccines would fail, um, but it's still worth it. Throwing away that money is, is, uh, is, um, is worth the chance of getting a vaccine sooner. It's also worth building out at large scale for many different vaccine candidates. Um, so, we, we um, but you can't expect firms to do that on their own because at least uh, they don't have commercial incentives to do so. So what, what we proposed was that governments pay to install capacity to produce enough doses to rapidly vaccinate the entire population right, to solve that static distortion for each of 15 to 20 promising vaccine candidates. Where did the number 15 to 20 come from? Well, you know, we made some some guesses about the chance of success with each candidate the, the, um, and the, the correlations in those chances. And uh, you, you know, the 15 to 20 number, the exact number will be sensitive to that, but uh, it's, it's quite robust that you want to invest in a lot of different candidates. There's also different platforms, different technologies, uh, you know, the, the mRNA technologies, the the, um, the viral vector technologies, you probably want to diversify across those. Okay. So what, what would governments get in exchange for paying for this? They'd get an option to buy the successful vaccines at a pre-specified price. You know, they probably want to give some surplus to the, uh, to the companies even there to, um, to, to ensure that they work with all, speed, all possible speed and an effort to you know, produce vaccines and produce them well. But, um, but what we, you know, what are the benefits of advanced contracting? You know, I, I guess I've said this before. Um, so, you know, faster, starting sooner on, on the capacity installation and getting larger capacity installation. And we recommended primarily what's called a push approach in contrast to the uh, pneumococcus advanced market commitment. We think there should be some pull, some, some uh, extra reward for the successful vaccine. But we argued it was worth paying up front for the capacity, even for vaccines that uh, might not be successful. So you know, why, why was that? We haven't, you know, 
written down, fully written down a form of model and you know would like to do so. But um, basically, this is I think what we what we were thinking. This is a case where the social planner would want many shots on goal. They'd want to invest in a lot of vaccines, not just the ones with the high probability of success, but you know a lot of ones with the lower probability of success as well. Particularly ones that are not correlate, where the success probability of success is a bit less correlated because they're using very different technologies. We thought that the the cost of installing capacity is reasonably well observable to the to the government. They can ask for the receipts for how much it costs to uh, to install the capacity. There's opportunity to inflate those, but you know if you're paying a little bit extra, that seems second order. On the other hand, it's difficult to know, and perhaps even more difficult to contract on, just given, given the way that uh, procurement is done in governments and, and the existing systems, uh, firms perceive probability of success. But um, we thought it would be roughly possible to gauge whether the probability, <laughs> lots of uh, typos in this, was working on the slides till the last minute. Um, but you know, figuring out whether it's worth whether there's a, a decent chance at all for a vaccine, that might be, the government might be able to uh, get some sense of that. So let me give a, a sort of a, an example of the way that uh, I've seen in law and economics paper, no Greek letters, but you know, some, uh, an example. Um, so suppose every unit of capacity, obviously super oversimplified. Suppose every unit of capacity costs $4 to install, Say there's three different candidates, one with a 20%, one with a 10%, one with a 5% chance of success. Treat these as independent, uh, just for the purposes of the example. Um, if you're, imagine you're doing an upfront payment uh, with uh, unconditional on success. You just pay for the capacity. Well, if you pay $4, um, the company will be willing to put it in. That would be true for any of the four, any of the three candidates. If you say, well, we're going to reward you if, the, if, the, if your vaccine is successful, but not otherwise, how much would you need to pay them? Well, if they've got a 20% chance of success, you need to pay them uh, five times the $4 it costs them to put in the, the capacity or $20. If they've got a 10% a chance of success, you have to pay them $40. If, you have to, if they've got a 5% chance of success, you have to pay them $80. So if you're limited, and, and obviously you know, one could quarrel with this, but if you're limited to offering a uniform price for all of these candidates, because you can't, uh, uh, you can't, you don't know their their individual probabilities of success, or you can't uh, prevail in a negotiation saying that, uh, or or order that based on a, um, uh, you know, just decree that they have to take this deal. Um, then, if you're offering the high price. Uh, the $80 price to try and pull in the third candidate, then you'll pay an average of 26, you, the expected payment is $26. Uh, with the posh, the expected payment is $12. It's substantially more expensive in this, in this cooked up example. Obviously you could say, well, we're just paying $40 and we'll just get candidate A and B. But since the social value of the vaccine is immense, maybe if there's even a 5% chance of success and I, can't do the math, but you know, a, a 30% chance, or sorry, 70% chance neither of the other candidates succeed, it's still worth it. Um, so you, you do want to bring in that candidate. Um, okay, and so this is obviously rigged up. We tried to, you know, we have a slightly, slightly more, a somewhat more sophisticated model where we tried to put in realistic numbers, and that suggests that these forces are quantitatively important. So we, we recommended mostly push in this context. Um, very different than the pneumococcus AMC on this dimension, but very similar in that you have an advanced contract that's designed to get to the efficient quantity as well as to reward success. So you don't have this trade-off between access and, uh, and incentives. We do think some, some poll element was, was worthwhile. Um, you know, there might be some manufacturers who know they have no chance. You don't want them to uh, have private information about that. You don't want them to take the government money, for example. Okay, the, the UK, the US through Operation Warp Speed and the UK did something very similar to what, what we recommended, you know, some differences. Um, then they made large investments, large, again, 
large relative to anything that had happened historically, much smaller than we recommended or we, we, you know, we, we think would have been uh, optimal. Um, and uh, actually I should have, this last point, significantly increasing global manufacturing capacity. I believe that these, the capacity that we got is much, much larger than anybody thought possible earlier on, but you know, that's something that other people might have a different perspective on. I'll come back to that. Um, you know, was this worth it? Again, I'm just looking at things from a domestic standpoint now. Operation for the US, Operation Warp Speed cost $13 billion. You know, that would have paid for itself if it ended the pandemic 12 hours sooner. Um, you know, it's these, these magnitudes are just very hard to comprehend from somebody who's used to, who's a, who's a development economist and used to smaller numbers or for my, microeconomists in general. Um, you know, we recommended much, much more. We, this, we, we tried to do this analysis for a range of countries. You know, this is, we found this was maybe not quite to the same scale, but very large investments would have been appropriate for middle income countries as well, and even for low income countries. Even low income countries would have wanted multiple shots on goal, maybe not 15 to 20 of them. Um, the, um, okay. Um, and so we're, you know, we continue to call for, for more contracts of this type. Um, let me turn to the international uh, aspects of this. Um, the, um, so I'm having a bit of trouble advancing my slides. Okay, I'll do it that way. Um, the, um, so here's the supply and demand diagram. Um, you know, the, the, the demand side come, comes out of our model of would it be optimal for countries to buy at various prices? The, um, the supply side comes from what the experts, we, this, you know, we put this together early in the, the pandemic, experts were telling us it's gonna be very, you know, they had the Leontief model in mind. You can reconvert some existing unused capacity uh, over to this use, but after that, there's nothing you can do. You know, we sort of compromise between the economists' view that thing, everything's elastic and, and their view by putting a, a pretty inelastic supply after a after a kink point. Okay, that um, the you know, but that that you know, we have very little information on what that supply curve should be, but you know. It looks like you would think that there'd be, uh, if you believe there's uh, an elastic supply after some point, the implication is that you'll get very large profits. Some firms have a low cost of production. Um, they had idle capacity. Um, so they'll, you know, the price will go up to that level. Prices will be very high and there'll be lots of profits. You know, what's going on? Well, you know, at the time, this is an adapted version of an old slide you know, maybe everybody thought, oh, the demand's going to be lower. There'll be lots, you know, super elastic supply. So we don't need to, to, to you know, buy at a high price. Um, I don't think that's what happened. I think it becomes, it's become even clearer. You know, another story would be maybe every supplier is pricing at their own cost plus some margin because of ethical or political concerns. Now that would generate, sorry, again, some problems on the slide. Um, that would generate a race among buyers to lock in low prices. Everybody would want to move first. But it, I, it now looks like the high cost suppliers maybe aren't even entering at all. And I'll give a, an example of that, or at least a probabilistic example in a minute. Um, then there's going to be rationing of the available supply. And I think that's what's happened. And then it goes to, um, you know, it, it goes to people who are, who have, um, who aren't just able to pay, but have other advantages, like the production is in their country and they can put on an export ban, um, or their market is very important long run. So the pharmaceutical firms want to get along with them long run. Um, that means there might be a lot of misallocation among buyers. You know, one nice thing, uh, there are a lot of bad things about the price system, and this might have been. Uh, been, um, uh, been very hard for poor countries to afford if prices just went up, but 
um, you know, within an income class, it might go to those who would, who would need it the most. Okay. Um, okay. You could also get hoarding if the price system isn't, isn't functioning. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, there could be controversy over what was the effect of things like Operation Warp Speed. I think certainly when we were recommending very large scale purchases, but purchases of capacity, not of doses, um, we were hoping that this would push out, expand the total production available. But in the, in the, you know, this is presumably some mix of buying up the existing capacity and pushing out, you know, getting more capacity. The buying out, the pushing out the, um, in the short run from the perspective of other countries, well, the existing capacity is now gonna be uh, in greater demand and that's going to make it either drive up the price or make it harder to get the vaccine if there's rationing. In the long run, one would hope, and I think this did actually happen, and you know, you could argue that there was a tripling or quadrupling of capacity due to this. Um, we're increasing, we're increasing the potential supply. So once the U.S. got vaccinated, for example then that vaccine becomes available to, to, the production capacity becomes available to the rest of the world. So there might be positive externalities as well as negative externalities. There's a lot of public discussion or has been of the, of the negative side uh, international externality, but there may also be a, a, a positive one. Uh, let me come, I'll come back to this in a minute uh, when we think about pandemic, uh, uh, well, I'll come back to it right away actually. Let me note that the same thing applies to inputs as well. Um, and so, you know, similar diagram here, but here I've drawn, and this could be done for the final vaccine as well, the long run uh, elasticity, and I've drawn that completely flat. We think of long run elasticity as a lot flatter. So while in the, if we're, uh, that's gonna be important as we think about uh, pandemic preparedness. Okay, so let me move on to that. Okay, so the first thing, which is, doesn't involve any strategic uh, considerations among countries is that, you know, this would apply if the world, had, if we had, within a country or if we had a world government, any policymaker would want to in, invest in a lot of standby capacity for vaccines and invest in inputs. For, for the actual vaccines, you, know, you don't know exactly what the layout of the factory is gonna be and you're gonna have to modify it, but you want, uh, you want things that are sort of on standby so that as soon as we have a vaccine that works, we can start producing or even, even beforehand, even once we get some indications of it. For inputs, probably a standby capacity, but you could also have stockpiles. And you know, I've seen some, you know, just saw some reports saying, yes, we need to do this. We need to be able to produce 15 billion doses within six months. I would argue we don't need to be able to produce 15 billion doses. We need to be able to produce um, uh, you know, five times that amount because you need multiple shots on goal. As soon as you've got a, a plausible vaccine candidate, you should start making that vaccine production facility specialized to that candidate. And you probably wanna do that for you know, many vaccine candidates. And we've done some you know, rough, very rough cost benefit calculations suggesting this. So that would be, and it turns out, you know, let's say with the 2% chance per year of a pandemic, um, that, that would be, be very worth, have very high returns. If you believe that prices are not going to jump through the roof in the next pandemic, and we're gonna see something similar to what we saw for COVID, you know, the commercial incentives to put that standby capacity that's idle most of the time, it's not going to be strong enough. It'll require public subsidy. So I think there's a strong case for doing this, neglecting the international context, but I think that case becomes even stronger if we think about the international context. There's been a lot of discussion of vaccine nationalism. And I would, I think this is not just a matter of the, of the sort of national, you know, clearly we've got a lot of populist nationalism with Modi, with Trump um, in the world right now, but I don't think it's specific to them. I think any, any government, any democratically elected government is going to have, uh, or any government, you know, any government that relies on votes uh, from their own citizens is gonna have very strong incentives to vaccinate their own population first. And that means that export bans or 
hoarding of vaccines, which some have accused the U.S. of, you know, vaccinating people at very low risk, while people in 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 uh, at very high risk of death, elderly people, um, are go and are going unvaccinated in in the middle of terrible epidemics. Um, um, that uh, holding on to um, for, for a while, we were holding on to uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, which you know, we didn't, hadn't approved here. You know, in a pandemic, from a domestic point of view, if there's some chance you'll need this vaccine, that makes sense. Um, but from an international point of view, it's, um, from a global point of view, it's not going to save the most lives. Moral persuasion, um, I don't think, is likely to solve the problem on its own. I think what, what to do, and uh, I'll have to see what, uh, whether I've got, got this right, uh, whether Eric will approve of these, these terms, but you need to change the game. You need to, if we think about a, a Markov game where you know, we're, we're, we wanna change the state of that game when, uh, when the next pandemic hits. And the way to do that is to put, the, put a lot of capacity in place now. So if there's sufficient standby capacity in stockpiles to avoid shortages, then that can potentially change politicians' incentives. If, they, if we go into the next pandemic knowing that vaccines gonna be highly available, um, then politicians won't have nearly as much incentive to put on export bans. Now there are things we can do beyond that. You could put the, you know, put a lot of capacity in Singapore, um, you know, which has a big vaccine industry. Well, you know, even if Singapore says we're getting ourselves vaccinated first, that's not gonna take long. So there are other things you can do. Let me, there have been some, some policymakers have said we have to do this all centrally through one global effort. I think there's, I don't, I think um, in general, I think there's been some people haven't paid enough attention to what's incentive compatible for governments here. Um, and, but I think if we think about pandemic preparedness, if we think about COVID, you can argue it either way. Was, was, uh, was Operation Warp Speed good for the US and bad for the rest of the world or was it good for both? Uh, there's a, you can legitimately debate that. If we're thinking about pandemic preparedness, it's a totally different situation. Let me just go back a couple of slides. You know, when there's a steep curve, supply curve, well then maybe there's some of these negative externalities as well. But long run, there's a pretty flat supply curve. Um, so if Germany or the US puts, or China puts in lots of uh, extra capacity, that doesn't hurt the rest of the world. They can buy it at roughly the same price. They, and there's not gonna be shortages of putting that in uh, over some period of time that we're, we're preparing. Moreover, I think it's important to think of standby capacity and stockpiles as insurance. It's actually not just insurance, we pay people a lot of money when they have a high marginal value of consumption, but rather we give people, we have a good which has very low value in most states of the world and very high value in some states of the world, like services of a fire department. Now, most epidemics are geographically concentrated. If you think of you know, Ebola or Zika, um, but even COVID was, there's huge variation across regions of the world um, and, and how intense it was. In the COVID-19 pandemic, COVAX, I think 5% of their supplies go to places with you know, particularly bad outbreaks. The rest of it, it goes in proportion to population. Maybe that was impossible to do anything else because we were, you know, these rules were set when everybody knew what, how, how, how strongly they were hit. And, and uh, countries that weren't strongly hit would, would want it um, uh, done that way. But if we think about the next pandemic, we're behind the veil of ignorance. We, can, we should all be able to agree to prioritize based on disease burden. Obviously that, if we think of this as insurance, there's some moral hazard issues. I think you could require some steps to address moral hazard. If you wanna be part of this, uh, this you know, global effort, you have to have people wear masks or whatever the analog is. Um, the, um, you could also say you have to contribute if you wanna be high in the queue. And obviously I would be in favor of not asking low income countries to pay for this, but you know, within the set of high income countries and maybe even upper middle income countries, I think it's appropriate to ask for some, uh, some contributions. 
I also think, as with insurance, you want rules in advance of how you're going to allocate, or at least procedures. You know, if you have a situation, I think there was a lot of time lost in bargaining over who was going to control things in this pandemic, you know, WHO versus Trump versus et cetera, but even among the international organizations. And then it was unclear for low-income countries, should they sign these deals in advance or should they wait for COVAX to supply them? I think you want clear rules so every in advance so everybody uh, can act quickly. Okay, let me come to um, you know what I think is the the policy implication that I'm most um, most excited about now, and I think it connects to the rest of the talk. I've said that their private incentives to invest in increasing supply are, are smaller than social incentives. So most of the pandemic we've been calling for trying to get more, you know, do deals to get more capacity. And we continue to call for that in this group. But we think that there's another possible way to get more capacity that's worth exploring. So let me, uh, um, and that's to explore other dosing regimens. And you'll see the scale of the, um, of the failures as I, as in, in uh, R&D incentives as I go through this. I think this is partly for people just fought following status quo procedures, partly it's a matter of incentives. So I'll argue in a, in a minute that alternative dosing regimes could potentially dramatically accelerate global COVID-19 vaccination. For a non-COVID e example, Brazil with uh, you know, approval from the WHO, they had a yellow fever outbreak and they used one fifth doses because there was a shortage of supply and that worked. Now. I'm not making the medical judgment that, you know, we should all switch to one fifth doses. That's, uh, that's something where, you know, medical people should be making the call. But what I will argue that the costs of testing this are dwarfed by the potential benefits. So here's a chart uh, published by Corey et al. that shows the relationship between the moon, mean neutralizing antibody level, that's basically the immune system response, and efficacy against disease. Okay. And you'll see there's a very tight relationship there. So up at the top are Moderna and Pfizer, you know, then there's somewhere in the middle is, is AstraZeneca, then, you know, some of the Chinese vaccines uh, uh, down just hovering around 50% efficacy. Efficacy against severe disease is much higher, but, but, uh, but you can see it's a very tight relationship. Now, it's just suggesting we consider alternative doses. We don't have data on efficacy for alternative doses, but early in the early in the in the pandemic, they conducted phase two trials where they tried out different doses. That's normally done to trade off efficacy against side effects, and get some sense of what to go with. They were moving really fast. They picked something and they moved on, but that trade off of efficacy versus side effects. In the middle of a pandemic, you also, there's another advantage of smaller doses, which is you can vaccinate more people. Now, would that really hurt efficacy? Again, we don't know. I don't want to, you know, these are, this is not a uh, experimental evidence, but let's take this relationship between immune system response and efficacy, and let's add in the immune response for fractional doses. So if you look, let's start with Moderna. If you see the shaded circle, that's the uh, current standard dose of Moderna. Okay, if you go to 50% of that standard dose, you'll see you basically can't see much difference in efficacy at all. These are certain, I'm sure these would be, you couldn't reject the hypothesis that these are this, that the predicted efficacy from, from a half dose given this graph uh, would be the same as, uh, is, is indistinguishable from that of the, uh, of the of the full dose. Even if you go down to a quarter goat dose, okay, you, you have a lower immune response there, but that's still associated with more than 90% efficacy. Again, associated with, it's not proof. Um, this is true also for, you know, for Pfizer, um, the, the one third dose looks pretty good uh, for AstraZeneca. Um, and there's, you know, that it wouldn't necessarily be true for all vaccines, uh, and maybe for any, but there's reason to think that it's it's plausible that there might be high efficacy. We plug this into some standard epidemiological models, 
And it sounds like, you know, you could potentially have very big reductions in deaths. Um, um, you know, like up to 50% of deaths could be averted if you could speed up vaccination uh, by, by, by getting three doses or four doses for every dose or even two doses for every dose. And, you know, even if, you, even if the efficacy losses were much bigger than, than this chart would suggest, um, you know, th this would still be beneficial. Okay, lots of caveats on that. Um, what do we need to learn, do to learn more about this? Well, first you could do more immunogenicity studies for different vaccine and dose combinations. That could deliver outcomes in weeks, require a few hundred volunteers. You could do that in place without any disease risk because you're just testing the immune system. There's one trial underway uh, for Moderna in Belgium of half doses. The other thing is that some jurisdictions could decide they're gonna implement fractional dosing based on the existing evidence, or they could conduct trials as part of their vaccine rollouts. So when the UK moved to first doses first, it was based on very similar evidence to, to what I've shown. They didn't know what the efficacy would be. And that seems to have worked out pretty well. But let me note, that's not true for all vaccines. And in other cases, first doses first isn't working. And uh, so there are risks associated with this. But you know you can monitor it and uh, and uh, you know change your policy. I'll come back to that in a minute. One Brazil is actually currently conducting a trial of half doses with thirty five thousand people. That's um, that is something that you know would give you know much more solid evidence than just doing the further immune studies. You know why do I think this is so valuable? Well, if efficacy is found to be low, all the participants could then get full doses. So. You know, you'd have some period of exposure while you're learning about efficacy. And so I don't want to claim the costs are zero, but the costs would be limited. And if, in, if we're thinking that we don't have enough doses for everybody anyway, then you know, I would argue that actually in expectation, people are better off by participating in a trial and getting a half dose rather than half a chance of a full dose. But anyway, that's a separate conversation. If efficacy is found to be high, you know, fractional dosing could be implemented broadly. You know, huge benefits for, for Brazil from this, huge benefits for the world. So to conclude, I think there's, you know, a lot of, I think it's worth looking at way, other ways of encouraging R&D. Um, you know, reforms to intellectual property rules are trading off two very important things against each other. At least in the case of vaccines, I think with advanced contracting, we can, we can achieve both. Um, you know, they'll still, you're not going to get to the first best, but I think we can, I think we can do better than we're currently doing. Um, might be worth thinking about other mechanisms. Uh, for example, for therapeutics, you might be able to buy out patents and put them in the public domain which would have some advantages relative to advanced contracting. Um, and, and probably particularly for the case of therapeutics. Second implication is um, for pandemics and for future pandemics, we should invest in the production capacity in advance. Um, and the third implication is there are some types of research that have very high social returns, but much lower commercial returns or even national returns. And we need a, some sort of system for uh, financing this research for the benefit of the world. I've focused on vaccines, but let me, arguably the distortions uh, are even larger for research on, for example, non-pharmaceutical interventions. No companies, you know, a vaccine company makes some money figuring out that um, we didn't need to close schools, but we did need to wear masks. Um, and improve ventilation earlier, it's very hard to see how, how, um, how companies would have made money from that, uh, but it would have been a tremendous value for the world. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there are uh, some questions that came up during uh, the talk, and I think now, I think it was better to defer them really to the end for now. So, uh, <clears throat> um, so one question referred to how you calculated the GDP loss. Uh, in particular, there was a question of 
whether that, so maybe you want first to tell us more about that. And in particular, the question was whether you took into account that there was also an element of uh, increasing efficiency. Many businesses had to increase efficiency. This is, this is one element. And another element uh, that, that seems to be going on is uh, deferred consumption. So people couldn't spend on uh, uh, leisure activities, but you know now they are spending more. Uh, so whether these considerations were taken, whether it's possible, to, I'm not sure that. We, so it, it would be interesting to, to know a bit more about how you did that calculation. That was one question. Another question was, and uh, we asked you to please uh, say something if you know about how, why the European Union, uh, it seemed, what were the failures uh, in the way the European Union organized itself um, the third question uh, asked about the, the possibility of free riding of several countries in the sense that if, uh, for example, the United States invests in building capacity, then uh, other countries uh, can benefit from the fact that that capacity exists. Uh, finally, there was a question about um, uh, what do you think about the, the, the danger that uh, a producer faces from changing the rules of the game after production? So for example, uh, if I recall correctly, there was some talk of uh, uh, the government actually really requiring some cap on prices exports. So these these were were uh, four questions that came up while you were talking. Great. Um, so on the first one of the costs, you know, let me just be upfront. I'm sure we didn't get the costs right. Um, the um, you know what we did initially. So. I think to some extent, this work was sort of a, a hybrid between policy work that you would, you know, when your staff member in a government or your consultant working for a business, you need to come up with numbers in two days, you do the, you know, you make some assumptions, you do the best you can. Um, and, you know, but then in other ways, it was, it was sort of was like academic work. So I, I, I won't defend those numbers, but let me answer the question. These came from the World Bank IMF and OECD estimates of short run GDP losses, which were all pretty similar to each other. Of course, they may have uh, common biases. I know of two efforts to do this uh, more by, you know, more academically. One was by Cutler and Summers that came up with dramatically higher numbers. Um, I believe they came up with 18, again, if somebody's on Google, they can check this. I believe they came up with $18 trillion for the US um, whereas the, the World Bank and IMF came up with 12 trillion for the world. Um, the, um, they, um, the, um, Casey Mulligan uh, also did something, and I believe, I haven't gone over that recently, but I think his numbers were, were not that far uh, from the Cutler and Summers estimates. I agree that there are some ways in which there were some efficiencies that happened during during COVID, but I would argue that we're you know, Cutler and Summers, I believe, do not uh, do not even include the, the human capital losses, um, and those are just tremendous. Um, the you know many people in Latin America have been out of school for a year. Um, it's going to be hard to go back to school for many of those people. Um, the people have lost, um, you know, a colleague of mine has a nice paper on showing the human capital losses to teachers from what, during the time they're not teaching, not using COVID data, some, some other feature of the Greek uh, um, uh, education system, finds that they're huge. So, you know, I think a lot of, and then the mental health costs 
um, you know, I think those are those are serious as well. Um, so I I think uh, I think we're probably underestimating the cost. Um, the but that's not the point. Take all the numbers we had. You know, when we, just to, I'll give you another example of an assumption that I'm. You know, we just assume there's a 50% chance that the vaccines are going to be useless because the drug's going to be invented or you know th some you know something else that's going to make the disease go away um, so we put in assumptions so uh, I guess what I'm saying is with much lower numbers you would you would get similar uh, you get so you'd also get you invest in multiple vaccines maybe it wouldn't be 15 to 20 maybe it would be 10 but it's not going to be a lot less because it's a very the curve you know flattens out. Uh, a lot when you get up to a lot of vaccines. It's just, um, um, okay, um, sorry, let me move on. What did the EU, um, you know, why was the EU not as uh, successful? Um, I think that, I think that they were trying to get better deals in some ways. I think the U US and UK we're more focused on moving quickly, which I think was the right thing to do. Um, I don't claim to be an expert in this. Um, I think also there's something about the needing to have co-op, needing to get that many parties together makes it harder to move very quickly. And, um, and that's perhaps something structural. Um, and maybe it's worth the EU thinking about other procedures so it can move more quickly and in emergencies in the future. Um, the, um, I wasn't 100% I wasn't sure I got the third question, so tell me if I've got it wrong. What are the possible benefits of US investment? So I've argued before that, or any countries, China's investment in capacity for the next pandemic. I would argue that that not only doesn't have negative externalities, but it has pretty positive externalities because it's very possible that the next pandemic will be something that, you know, doesn't, who knows? In, in COVID, we got something that particularly attacked, at least initially, hit the high income countries more. Obviously, Zika wasn't like that. If we get something that, you know, that affects only very hot climates in Germany or Canada has vaccines uh, in stockpile, they may allow some of that to be to be used that, and presumably they're not gonna charge the full uh, social value of that. So that I think actually has positive externalities for other countries. Um, the, the question I think was, was not about the, yeah, the question was in a sense opposite that uh, there is a moral hazard issue in the sense that if, if some countries really are investing in building extra capacities, it decreases the incentives of others to do so. I think that was- Oh, I see, I see, I That see. was kind of the question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's why I think really clear rules of the game are, yeah, to some extent that's optimal. I, just to be, if I put on a very hard headed analysis, you know, if imagine all the countries in the world invest in five times the capacity they need. And um, a small, you know, Mali is then thinking about what to do. Mali has many health needs, many non-health needs. Uh, they might rationally decide that they want to invest less. Um, that, so it might be rational for Mali. Um, and I think the world should set up a system where we don't expect Mali to invest in this. And we should, uh, you know, high income countries should contribute. But obviously there comes a point where, you know, presumably Portugal should contribute, presumably Brazil should contribute something. I think it's key to work out the rules of the game. I mean, it's easy to say this, but it's good to have, to work out the rules of the game and to have clear rules so that, you know, Brazil understands that it's gonna to have to invest something um, if it's gonna expect, you know, they're gonna be at the bottom of the back of the queue if they don't invest and not to pick on Brazil, but uh, but if they don't invest and everybody else does, that uh, priority would go to the low income countries and to the countries that have paid into the system. I'm saying Brazil, you know, I could just as well say, you know, France or the US or whatever. Um, uh, so you know, uh, so I, I think that should probably be part of the, the optimal international deal. Um, the, um, on, on the danger from, from changing rules of the game, um, 
um, ex post, I am concerned about this. Um, you know, we were very lucky with COVID-19. The chance of success of, with vaccines is usually very small. We still don't have an HIV vaccine. We don't have a malaria vaccine. These are, these are difficult. Turned out COVID was, sounds strange to say this, but it was relatively easy to produce a COVID-19 vaccine. It's, we, we don't, we want companies to be preparing, working on these types of problems, even in advance. And some firms, let me give the example. I'm not trying to single out a single firm here, but you know, Merck, for example, invested pretty heavily in Ebola. They, they took a big loss. You know, they, they, they produced something, they, um, a vaccine, they, but then nobody was interested in paying for it after the, after the crisis was over. Um, that's, you know, a, a Merck did not, Merck did do some investments, um, but they didn't do, they didn't do as much as uh, one might have thought would be needed to match the social need for a COVID vaccine. Um, and because these vaccine production is so highly specialized, we saw all the production problems that that you know that affected Europe, for example. It's you you really there's a, a limited number of firms that are very good at rapidly producing large volumes of very high quality vaccines. And you want them all working on this. So um, that's why I think that, I, I would say, what, what we recommended was not, I, I, I think there are other reasons why waiving the patents uh, is not likely to be effective. There's a lot of technology transfer that has to be done. I would have preferred something that said, we're gonna reward any type of new production and if if the world wants to reward new production in um, in low and middle income countries more, or wants more firms competing, which they might, then say, well, we'll give you an extra bonus if this is a another firm rather than your firm, and you do the tech transfer to get the more production, and we'll give you an even bigger bonus if it's a, in a in a particular parts of the world. Um, so I think that's likely to be, you know, both more effective and to have less downside than. Um, than you know, waiving uh, the patents. You could, another approach would be to compulsory licensing. So the firm gets something um, and they get bonuses uh, for cooperating. But I think you, you really want their cooperation given the, the characteristics of, uh, the technological characteristics of vaccine production. Okay, the, in the meantime, there were two other questions that came in. Uh, one <clears throat> one refers to the effect of the pandemic on inequality. Uh, this is a little bit besides the topic of your talk, but if uh, if you, I mean, this is something you might want to comment on. Another thing that is more related to to really the topic of your talk is uh, uh, how to deal really with the risk. So you, you emphasized, uh, you know, involvement of government in uh, investing in capacity. Um, Eric in his talk, uh, also, the question is uh, whether there are additional means to mitigate uh, the risks that uh, firm face in development, whether there's there's some additional comments you would like to make about that. So you could repeat that. So if if I understand, if I understand, the, the question is about uh, the risks that are involved in uh, the process of develop developing the vaccine, and uh, you, you emphasize that the involvement of the government in, uh, in uh, <coughs> creating uh, production capacity. Uh, I guess the question uh, is whether you can make comments about uh, uh, the, the, the possibility of the government of uh, uh, addressing the risk that one faces in the development 
that the firm faces in the development itself. This is yeah. how I understand the question. Great, great. Um, well, let me start with that one. You know, there are there are there are risks in the R and D process, and in general, um, I think you know governments may want to subsidize the R and D process as well. You know, one way to do that is by supporting academic research and and sort of more fundamental research, but they may also, I think, it's typically um, appropriate to also subsidize. Um, you know some of the some of the R and the and the and and, and, and you know some of the R and D costs. Um, the um, the I didn't focus on that in this talk because um, there were already a number of vaccine candidates, and the costs of building the factory capacity out are larger than the costs of the initial you know initial research. But as a general principle, I think we should be doing that. In fact, you know, the reason we have these vaccines is because investments have been made in the past, you know, in the past five, 10 years to develop like the mRNA vaccines in particular, that's, you know, very recent technology that took a lot of work to develop. Um, and so, you know, I think there's benefits to subsidizing that. Um, the, on inequality, you know, you're right. This is not sort of the focus of this talk. Yeah, I think that I think there's one strange paradox is that within countries, poor people were hurt more. Across countries, and this may change, but up till now, higher income countries have been have been hit more. Um, I don't think we fully understand why that is. Um, you know, um, epidemiological models are very sensitive to to uh, to parameters and to the structure and you know maybe it's maybe it has to do with the type of housing construction or previous exposure to disease and um, who's survived that previous exposure there are all sorts of theories out there but I don't think we fully understand why um, um, there's another set of questions about what beyond the direct impact um, how easily can people adjust? And obviously, if you're, you know, we're we're doing this seminar over Zoom with, you know, in my case, some loss of uh, of efficiency, but uh, um, uh, but uh, but you know, minimal relative to if we had a job as um, as you know as orderlies in hospitals that we couldn't do remotely, um, or as fast food workers where um, we're put out of a job. So I think there's. Um, you know, I think there's a strong, uh, how, knowing how to implement this is difficult, but, um, um, you know, high income country governments try to do a lot of insurance and redistribution. Um, that's very difficult for some other countries to do. And, um, I guess a lesson would be, I think, I think there's all sorts of, um, of tail risks that we're exposed to. And it's now technologically possible to, I'm a development economist, so I'm focusing on the, the lessons for, for low and middle income countries, but some, it's now possible to get national ID systems going uh, with taking advantage of technology. So India didn't used to know who all its citizens were. I mean, obviously countries have very different uh, political views on on whether that's they want the government having that information, but India created a system. And the event, if you know, if you have a system like that, and you know where people live, then if there's a pen, if the epidemic affects a particular place, uh, you can target the relief measures there. If other types of disasters like a drought, um, you can also get cash transfers out quite efficiently now that people have mobile money. So I think trying to identify who's going to be hit worst by by disasters and trying to have ways of transferring resources to them um, is is something that we should be doing to prepare for the next pandemic or or other shock that hits us thank you uh, eric would you like to add a question or comment michael uh 
I don't have anything to ask, but uh, I, I would like to thank you uh, for, uh, for participating today. Uh, it, I think it's valuable uh, to have, uh, we, we, we don't have all the answers, uh, the theoretical answers about how to deal with, uh, with a big problem like, like COVID. It's too soon to tell, but uh, it's also too big an emergency to postpone all the analysis till later. And, and uh, I'd like to thank you for thinking about it and, and acting on your thoughts uh, during, the, uh, during the worst part of the pandemic. Thanks very much. I guess we will we will see in years whether it was in the right direction or the wrong direction. But uh, um, thanks, and it was a pleasure to participate. Michael, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. So we are resuming tomorrow at uh, nine Eastern and four p.m. Israel time. Thank you very much for participating in this. See you, see you all then. See you. Bye for now.